Hi, everybody. So today, uh, our presenter is Mr. Mr. Andrew Bennett, a biologist at the Big Thicket National Preserve, uh, just east of here in a little north of Beaumont. Uh, Andrew received his Bachelor's of Science in Plant Biology from UT Austin and received his Master's of Science in Wildlife Management and Forestry from Stephen F. Austin State University. He previously worked for the Army Corps of Engineers as a botanist, where he did wetland de delineations. Uh, Andrew then came to Big Thicket, where he's been for the past five years, and is here to give us some incredible insight into the Big Thicket area and some of the restoration work they're currently doing. And with that, I'll pass it off to Mr. Andrew Bennett. All right, let's get my presentation up. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, and thanks again for inviting me to speak um, at your meeting. It's great to have the opportunity to share a little bit about what makes Big Thicket special and some of the work that we do here. Um, <clears throat> so I work in a team of usually four people um, who handle resource management at Big Thicket. Um, currently we have three people, uh, that's us on the left. Uh, with one of our nonprofit partners. Um, I'm on the far left. Uh, next to me is uh, Mitch Urban, our biological science technician. Uh, and next to him is uh, Whitney Howeth, um, the chief of resources. So we've got, so we've got kind of a small office, um, but we cover all aspects of natural and cultural resources um, in the preserve. We coordinate research and monitoring um, we coordinate archaeological surveys. Um, we administer a public hunting program. We deal with uh, oil and gas operations that have been gra grandfathered into the preserve. Um, and a big chunk of what we do is restoration work. Um, because as you can kind of imagine, Big Thicket, um, like pretty much everywhere, has been pretty heavily modified through history. And so we've got a lot of restoration restoration work um, to do. Um, a big part of that, that is uh, invasive species control. Um, so kind of the, the main topic that I wanted to talk about this evening um, was kind of just a, a broad overview of some of the natural features at Big Thicket, um, kind of focusing on uh, different landforms and um, the vegetation associated with them. Uh, and some of the things that I guess I kind of think make the preserve interesting ecologically. Um, so the Big Thicket region of Texas, um, it's been defined a few different ways by different people through history. Uh, in general, it, it covers the far southeast corner of Texas, um, pretty much north of the coastal prairie ecoregion. Um, what really kind of separates this part of the Piney Woods from the rest of East Texas is um, being so far southeast, the climate is a lot warmer, it's a lot wetter, the landscape is a lot flatter. So we've got really extensive wetlands all over the place, um, wetlands in floodplains, wetlands outside of floodplains, um, which uh, is kind of different from the rest of East Texas. Coming from someone who went to graduate school in Nacogdoches and I did my grad work in Northeast Texas. Um, Southeast Texas, where I am now, uh, the wetlands are just amazing. So um, there's also kind of a, a unique cultural identity to the Big Thicket um, region of Texas compared to the rest of East Texas. Um, I'm not a historian or a, a cultural resources person, uh, but there's a lot that's been written on the subject and it's um, it's pretty interesting. I would, I would recommend reading up on it. Um, so Big Thicket as a national preserve, which is part of the National Park Service, um, it was established in 1974. Um, today it covers about 113,000 acres across seven different counties, um, stretching from Beaumont, Texas, up to close to Livingston and Jasper. Um, as, this isn't the best figure, but um, the preserve itself is kind of broken into a bunch of um, smaller units that I'll kind of be referring to a few times in the, in the presentation. And then those units are kind of linked together by, um, by corridors that follow the Natchez River and a few other creeks and bayous. 
So Big Thicket has also been designated a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, um, which is um, a program that recognizes areas of cultural and ecological significance all around the world. Um, it kind of tries to promote um, conservation in terms of ecological integrity, but also the traditional life ways of the communities that go along with those areas, um, kind of trying to, you know, harmonize the two, <clears throat> which is something we incorporate into the preserve as well, um, in the way that we facilitate hunting and fishing and trapping, which, um, you know, you don't always see in a national park. So getting to more of the natural features of the preserve, um, this was just gonna kind of be a, an overview of um, the things that I wanted to highlight. Um, so very broadly speaking, in the north part of the thicket, uh, you have more rolling topography. Um, and in the south, it's a lot flatter. Um, I'm gonna talk about seeps and springs, uh, which is really common where you have slopes. Um, the Natchez River and the Natchez River floodplain, which is um, a big predominating feature in a, in a big part of the preserve. Uh, and, then, um, and then something that's a little bit more localized, but I think worth pointing out is um, these uh, small deposits of sands that occur on Village Creek and Turkey Creek. They're kind of localized, but they have a really unique vegetation associated with them. So um, one of the reasons for the rolling hillier topography in the northern part of Big Thicket um, is a geologic feature called the Kisatchee Cuesta. Um, some people call it the Kisatchee Wald. It's basically an escarpment that runs from central Louisiana, kind of near Alexandria, um, west into East Texas. Um, and it's, it's kind of an uplifted area. Uh, it's highly eroded, so it's not nearly as dramatic as other escarpments in Texas, you know, like the Balcones or Cap Rock, but um, it still has an important impact on the vegetation in the area. Um, if you ever hear people refer to the Longleaf Ridge in Texas, especially um, talking about Angelina National Forest or Sabine National Forest, they're more or less talking about the, the Kisatchee Cuesta in Texas um, and the Longleaf Pine that grows kind of on that region of hilly. Um, hilliness. So um, the preserve, the Big, Big Thicket National Preserve, um, the northern part just kind of catches a little bit of that, um, that escarpment. And actually, in the northeastern part of the preserve in the Canyonlands unit, um, you get an intersection of the Kasachi Cuesta with the Natchez River floodplain. And so um, you have a pretty significant amount of hills and um, dramatic changes in elevation in the canyon lands unit. So um, one of the main vegetation types that you find um, in this hillier topography in the northern part of Big Thicket is upland pine savanna. Um, being in the, in the piney woods, you find pine savanna from here all the way up to Northeast Texas. Um, in this case, uh, pine savanna in this area would have been dominated by longleaf pine, um, uh, which kind of distinguishes it from the rest of um, East Texas. Longleaf pine doesn't really historically have grown north of Nacogdoches much. Um, so if you're not familiar already, uh, longleaf pine savanna is kind of an open grassy woodland um, it's kept relatively free of hardwood trees and shrubs um, due to frequent low intensity fire, at least historically. Um, the ground cover is dominated by warm season bunch grasses, which um, are very similar to tall grass prairie. You get a lot of the same species like um, little blue stem, big blue stem, um, and then a bunch of other species as well. Um, and it's kind of renowned for its herbaceous plant diversity. Uh, you can get as many as 30 to 40 um, plant species in a single square meter in the ground cover um, in good examples of longleaf pine savanna. Um, so let's see, oh, here's a good picture of some big blue stem, a prescribed fire in, in the preserve. 
So um, one of the great places to see upland pine savanna in the preserve is in the big Sandy um, Creek unit uh, in the northwest part of the preserve. Um, we actually have a small area of old growth longleaf pine that's um, pushing 80 to 90 years old. So um, it's a great example of longleaf pine. I would, I would recommend um, going up to that spot if you're interested. Um, so here are some examples of um, that herbaceous understory diversity. Um, one of the special things about upland pine savanna in Big Thicket is that it's where you find a high proportion of our species of conservation concern, um, both plants and animals. It's where you find um, endangered Texas trailing flocks, which is that plant in the middle, um, and probably a couple dozen other plants, imperiled and vulnerable plant species that aren't necessarily listed. Um, it's where you historically would have found red cockaded woodpeckers, which are endangered, um, Louisiana pine snake, Backman sparrows, um, lots of other songbirds as well. And actually, so the preserve had red cockaded woodpeckers up until I think the mid 90s. And so um, we've, we've really ramped up restoration in longleaf pine uh, over the last few years. And a lot of that is geared towards eventually bringing back red cockaded woodpeckers. Um, a lot of the restoration work we do, it's basically focused on reducing vegetation density. Um, so a lot of these areas are impacted by fire suppression, not surprisingly. Um, and so they've grown a lot denser than they were. They're, they're not an open savanna anymore. Um, so we've got a really active prescribed fire program. Um, they, they have ramped up as well. They burn, they try to burn every two years at this point. Um, and we also kind of match that with mechanical um, removal of uh, excessive debris and hardwood, uh, hardwood trees and shrubs uh, using a, a mulcher. Um, and we actually also apply a little bit of herbicide as well. Um, a lot of the shrubs that we deal with are yopon and American beautyberry uh, and some others. Uh, and they, they'll re-sprout almost indefinitely, you know, even if you burn every, every other year, they'll, they'll keep coming back. And so what we found is it's really effective to just go in and, um, you know, after a burn, the shrubs will kind of be knocked back to the ground and they'll start to grow back. And when they're still just a foot or two tall, we can just go in and spray them um, and, uh, and it, it kills them to the root and then we don't have to worry about it. And from then on, prescribed fire is enough to kind of prevent new shrubs from coming in. So uh, the next vegetation type I wanted to talk about is um, mesic hardwood forest. Uh, it goes by a few names. Some people call it rich hardwood forest. Um, a lot of people at the preserve will call it slope forest um, because a lot of the best examples come from um, places where you have more hills, like in the north part of the preserve. Uh, in fact, the, the Canyonlands unit that I referred to earlier is a really great place um, to see this kind of vegetation. Uh, we have really beautiful beach and magnolia forest out there. Um, and it, it doesn't feel like you're in Southeast Texas because it's so, um, so hilly. Um, but these areas, the main thing about them is they're kind of not too dry, not too wet, um, less fire prone than the pine uplands. And so you get, um, uh, you get a really big diversity of shrubs and hardwood trees. And that's kind of what it's renowned for is its diversity of woody plants. Um, contrasting that to pine savanna, which is kind of known for its um, herbaceous plant diversity. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the Canyonlands unit up in the northeast corner of the preserve is a great place to see it. Um, there aren't good parking areas or true trails out there. So some other places that are a little easier to access would be the um, the Woodlands Trail in the Big Sandy Creek area in the northwest part of the preserve. And then again, around the Kirby Nature Trail, which is in the Turkey Creek unit at the center of the preserve, pretty close to our visitor center. So it's, it's pretty easy to get to. Um, 
another another aspect that um, these uh, music hardwood forests are known for uh, is their um, here's some examples of that uh, woody plant diversity. A lot of under understory shrubs, shade tolerant shrubs, witch hazel, some maples. Um, we have a um, dwarf chestnut uh, related to American chestnut. Um, but another thing that hardwood forests are kind of known for here are um, the herbaceous plants that pop out in winter and spring and kind of do their thing early on in the season and then go dormant in the summer, um, known as spring ephemerals. Um, they're really known, you know, in the eastern U.S. They're kind of, um, things like trilliums kind of remind me of more of, you know, the Appalachians or the northeast forests. But uh, right now they're actually out and about, so now's a great time to visit and, and see them. Here's some more examples. So um, another special habitat um, worth noting are seeps and springs, um, which are pretty common anytime you have sloping ground uh, here in East Texas. Um, so I actually grew up in Galveston County and I'm used to living in coastal prairie, which is almost totally flat. The soil is very dense. You don't get a lot of groundwater movement, but in East Texas, of course, you have um, sandier soils and looser soils where the water moves quite a bit underground. And so um, anywhere you get sloping ground, you'll have groundwater that's also kind of flowing beneath the surface along the contour. And at the base of slopes, a lot of times that groundwater comes up to the surface. And so you get this kind of little spot of saturated soil, it, it stays saturated and you get um, a little isolated wetland. And so um, when you get a spot like this, uh, when it, and it's surrounded by um, pine savanna, for example, uh, and the wetland itself is exposed to fire, you get these herbaceous dominated wetlands or seeps. Um, a lot of people call them uh, bogs or seepage bogs. Um, and they're really cool places because you get this combination of hydric soils and, and fire that comes in on a regular basis, which seems counterintuitive. Um, and then a lot of times the soil is very leached of nutrients, so it's very low nutrients. Um, and that creates the specific habitat that supports carnivorous plants, um, as well as a few um, orchids, and club mosses. Um, here's some examples of uh, carnivorous plants. Um, the pitcher plants right now are actually pretty close to peak bloom, so it'd be a great time to go out and see those. Um, here's some of the orchids, some of the club mosses that we've got. Um, so the premier place to see this kind of habitat would definitely be the pitcher plant trail. Um, and it's a trail with a boardwalk that goes right through one of these seeps one of these seeps, so you can really get down and see the, the plants. So where a seep occurs in a more, um, in a place that's more protected from fire, uh, they tend to grow up into shrubby or forested wetlands. And these areas are what are usually referred to as bagals or bagal wetlands. Um, I've never, to be honest, I've never gotten a really solid um, definition on what a bagel is. Uh, it seems to be one of those things where you kind of just know it when you see it, but um, the name comes from bay plants like um, sweet bay magnolia and gallberry, uh, which is a, a type of holly. Um, we also uh, have a lot of um, Swamp tai tai, which is another shrub that occurs in bay galls, um, which is a cool species because it, it actually ranges down into South America. Um, uh, so yeah, these are, I don't have a lot of great pictures of bay galls because honestly, it's hard to get into them. Um, they're not the easiest places to access. Um, but there are a few rare plants that occur in them, um, specifically thinking of something called uh, Texas screw stem, which is Bartonia texana. Um, I think it's being petitioned for listing as endangered. So uh, if it if it does go through, then that'll be one more 
uh, endangered species that we have in the preserve. So bay galls occur all over the place. Um, some of them are small, so they, they're kind of just, you know, anywhere you have a wet pocket, you'll get bay galls. Um, but some good places to see those would be the, um, the Beechwoods Trail in the Beech Creek unit in the Northeast. And then in Big Sandy Creek unit again, uh, you can see bay galls at, um, what's it called? Uh, Beaver Slide Trail. And then again, down at the Kirby Nature Trail, close to the visitor center, there, there, are, good, some, there are some good examples of bay galls there too. All right, so kind of switching gears and talking more about the southern part of the preserve, which again is really flat and overall pretty poorly drained. Um, <clears throat> you get um, a vegetation type that I, I kind of think is the defining feature of the southern part of Big Thicket because they're so widespread and common. Uh, and these are pine flatwoods. And um, they're basically a lot like upland pine savanna, except in this case, they're wetlands. Um, they occur in really flat areas that just never drain. They stay saturated for most of the year. A lot of times they will have some kind of restrictive layer uh, a foot or two down in the soil um, that'll prevent drainage of water. Um, what's really kind of interesting to me about these is that um, they're not really associated with a floodplain, you know, like with a bayou or a creek. Um, they kind of more occur in areas between stream systems and can actually be higher in elevation than floodplains, and yet they stay saturated for long periods. So um, they're a little bit counterintuitive sometimes. But uh, they also have a lot of diversity um, in the ground cover, just like upland pine savanna, just a kind of a different suite of species, different grasses and um, different forbs. Uh, you tend to get higher percentages of, um, of sedges over grasses in places. And in fact, uh, in the Lance Rozier unit, where our biggest area of pine flatwoods are, you actually have populations of, um, of sawgrass, the same sawgrass from the Everglades. And that's what this picture is on the left. And so it's, it's another sedge. In this case, it's a sedge that grows, you know, almost as tall as a person sometimes. Um, and another thing that's really distinctive of these areas is the abundance of crayfish. So on the right is a picture of a pine flatwoods wetland that was recently burned. And so it's kind of exposing the soil and you can see all those little bumps are crayfish burrows and they really, really pack themselves in there. Um, I'm more of a plant person. I don't know that much about crayfish, but um, with them being that abundant, I have a feeling they probably pay, play a really big role in the ecosystem uh, in this kind of habitat. So another unusual feature of these areas um, are the abundance of pimple mounds or mima mounds. Um, I think I've heard that pimple mounds also occur in the coastal prairie ecoregion, so you guys might already be familiar with them. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in this case, it's more of a forested context. Um, but they're all over the place in the southern part of the, of the preserve. And um, you don't always know that they're there walking around on the ground. But um, looking at them from above, they can really pop out, especially where the, the hydrology of the site is such that the trees can really only grow on top of the mounds. Uh, it becomes really obvious. And then on the right, so this. On the right, the image is the same frame as on the left, um, but it's an, an elevation map. Um, and it kind of, um, it shows just how abundant they are. Uh, they're all over the place. In this case, they tend to be um, around 100 to 150 feet wide and um, maybe up to a yard higher than the rest of the, the elevation around them. But it's one of those things that creates a really fine mosaic of different habitats that increases diversity. 
Um, so a great place to see pine flatwoods wetlands in the preserve um, is the, uh, uh, the northern part, the northern circle here is um, the Sundew Trail in the Hickory Creek Savannah unit. Um, another great place and really where I think is the best place to see them is a spot that doesn't have a trail. Uh, it's the one in the center here. It's within walking distance of the visitor center and it's called the Solo Tract. Um, there's not really a place to park, but if you go to the visitor center and ask them how to get to the Solo Tract, then um, they'll point you in the right direction. It was just burned to the spring and I was out there last week and it, it looks amazing right now. It's actually so, um, it's so kind of fresh after the burn that you can see the pimple mounds from the ground. And then another spot, really the main place where we have um, uh, wetland pine savanna is the Northeast part of the Lance Rozier unit. But that, again, that's another place that doesn't have a great place to park and walk in. So I would really recommend checking out the solo tract. Okay, so moving on to uh, the Natchez River. <clears throat> So the Natchez River within the Big Thicket, it runs from, we've got, I think, 60 miles of it. Uh, we've, we've got a really long stretch of the, the river going from um, Lake B.A. Steinhagen uh, up by, what is it, Martin Dye State Park, um, all the way down to the I-10 Bridge in Beaumont. Um, most of that's just a narrow corridor, but we've got three units on the Natchez River that kind of give you a good cross-section of the floodplain. Um, so like, like pretty much all the rivers in the southeast, um, during the late Pleistocene epoch, the, the Natchez River was much, much larger than it was, uh, than it is today. And so that ancient uh, Natchez River carved out a huge floodplain, uh, way bigger than the current Natchez River could have ever carved out itself. And all along the edge of that Pleistocene floodplain or that terrace um, is a, a pretty dramatic change in elevation. And that's one of the sources of the hilly topography that you find up in the Canyonlands unit. And so on the left here, we've got another elevation map. Uh, in this case, the red, the reddish color represents higher elevations and the blue is the lower elevations. Uh, the dark blue is the actual Natchez River channel. Um, and going from red to blue in this map uh, is at least a 70 foot change in elevation, which um, in this spot can occur in over less than a quarter of a mile. So um, it's a pretty big drop, a pretty fast drop too for this, considering we're in Southeast Texas. So, and then on the right is a picture of one of those bluffs that is so steep that it's just constantly eroding and it, it never fully vegetates. But it's a great place to visit um, in the winter when the leaves are off of the trees, you can actually stand there and look out and see the horizon, which is pretty unique considering you know, we're in Southeast Texas. So the Canyonlands unit where we just were is up at the top of the Natchez River within the preserve. Now we're a little bit farther south in the Jack Gore Bagel unit. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I kind of wanted to point this out to show. So on the right, we've got an aerial image. It's an infrared image. So the darker red colors represent um, basically the uplands because those are pine trees. And then the kind of more grayish color, those are more hardwoods and cypress. So, but I wanted to point out, um, if you look on the left, there's this kind of grayish curving thing. That's, um, that's an old channel of the Pleistocene Natchez River. And then on the right is the current Natchez River. And so um, when you kind of compare the two and you kind of look at the curvature and, and the width of the channels, you can kind of get a sense of just how much bigger the Natchez River was at the end of the, the Pleistocene. Um, it was almost as big as the, the Mississippi, at the lower Mississippi. And so, um, so yeah, the Pleistocene Natchez River left behind all kinds of features like this in the landscape, which, um, which create a really diverse landscape 
lots of um, microhabitats. Um, in this case, these these channels are completely full of bald cypress. You know, from from bank to bank, it's just 100% bald cypress and tupelo. And uh, this is actually an image of of the slough. <clears throat> So going down the Natchez River a little further south, um, you get to the Beaumont unit, which is the third unit on the Natchez River. Um, and down in the Beaumont unit, uh, we're a little bit closer to the coast and lower in elevation. So the floodplain is a little bit wider. Um, it stays flooded for longer periods. And um, I just wanted to point out how in incredibly complex the channels are within the Natchez River floodplain in this area. Um, so you get all of these side channels, which, um, which form um, because of uh, meandering and because of um, uh, runoff from, from the uplands. And it just creates this really complex network of, of channels. Um, if you look on the right, so these two images are again, showing the same spot on the ground. Uh, if, you look on, if you look on the left, um, it's completely forested all the way through. You wouldn't even know there are all these little channels. And then on the right is another elevation map that shows um, the crazy network of channels that's um, separate from the actual, the Natchez River itself. And um, these are great places to go kayaking. Um, there's a Texas paddling trail called um, what is it? Cooks Lake to Scatterman Loop, and it takes you through some of these channels, and it's really amazing because it's it's forested all the way through. So um, you know there are endless channels and side channels that you can take, and the whole time you're actually under the canopy of trees. And here's um, here's kind of uh, pointing out where we're talking about. So here's the Canyonlands unit. And this is the Jack Gore Bagel unit, and this is the Beaumont unit. And um, the paddling trail is down just outside the city of Beaumont. So one last thing that I kind of wanted to touch on about the Natchez River, um, this time in the southern half of the Beaumont unit, even farther south um, to where we were just talking about, um, there's this management issue that we're facing, and it's um, the decline and or stagnation of bald cypress forest in, in the floodplain. So basically a lot of the bald cypress stands out there appear to be transitioning to open marsh um, dominated by giant cut grass, which is a native freshwater marsh grass. Um, <clears throat> but we don't see tons of young cypress establishing um, in the interior of these marsh areas. And um, so we're not getting a new, a crop of young trees to replace the old trees that are declining or the trees that used to be there. And, um, and so we're not 100% sure what the trajectory is of this area. Um, but uh, so here is an image of kind of the area that I'm talking about. On the left is actually an aerial photo from I think 1938. Um, some of the earliest aerial photography in the country, um, certainly of this quality. And so hopefully you guys can see this on your screens. Um, so these straight lines are canals that they dug into, just straight into the swamp. And then off of these canals are areas with these little lines that radiate out from one point. And um, those are basically, these are uh, access points where they would go in, they would cut trees, and then they would drag them into that one spot um, on the canal so that they could take them out uh, through the river. And so, um, so it was just, you know, from the river all the way to the edge of the floodplain, they, they took it all. And, um, and so this, this image is from the 1930s. We have images from the 1950s and 70s. And uh, looking at those, it never, it looks like the cypress never really fully recovered. And so um, flash forwarding to today on the right, or almost today, this is um, 2008. Um, uh, 
uh, you can see these patches, these light colored patches are just um, big expanses of marsh that um, I don't think were there historically. But another one of the challenges that we're facing related to this is saltwater intrusion. So there's a saltwater wedge that comes in from the Gulf. It kind of creeps in underneath the freshwater up the, the river channel. And um, during low flow periods, it can get into the, the swamp itself. And actually during the 2011 drought, um, the, the, um, the swamp became really, um, a lot of salinity came in and uh, there was a, a lot of mortality um, to the trees. So, which is kind of, it's kind of a catch 22 because um, if you might be familiar that bald cypress and water tupelo, they need a dry down period in order for seedlings to establish. So they need the river to dry down a little bit in order for seedlings to even take root. But when the river is low, that's when the salt water comes in and it really, it kills everything. Um, so uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers built a saltwater uh, barrier upstream of the Beaumont unit, um, which, uh, which has helped protect everything upstream of, of the barrier, but it leaves the, the bottom half of the Beaumont unit totally exposed to saltwater. So, and um, on that note, just last week, uh, we were working with some hydrologists from the National Park Service and I think Colorado State University. And we went out to these areas and put um, monitoring wells, uh, which will monitor groundwater levels and um, above groundwater levels too, as well as salinity. So um, we're hoping to kind of combine the data that we get from the wells and the data that um, the Army Corps of Engineers and the Lower Nature's Valley Authority have to kind of figure out how salt moves through this system. Okay, so um, the last vegetation type that I kind of wanted to um, touch on, touch on, on are xeric sand hills or sandy lands. Um, so this kind of vegetation is our driest, most xeric vegetation type in Big Thicket, totally different from where we just were. Um, <clears throat> but ironically, these areas occur in the floodplains of the lower Village Creek and uh, Turkey Creek. So basically, Village Creek and Turkey Creek deposited these, these high deposits of really coarse, well-drained sands. Um, and on top of those, um, we, get, uh, we get a vegetation type that's adapted to this really dry habitat. Um, in a lot of ways, it's basically um, longleaf pine savanna, again, except in this case, it's kind of on the more xeric end of what pine savanna occurs in. Um, it's a little different. You get a lot of blue jack oak and a lot of sand post oak mixed in with the pine trees. Um, you have some areas that are so, uh, they're so dry that they have a hard time staying vegetated. And if you look on the left, um, you can kind of see the white sand as it peeks through up underneath the vegetation because it's, um, it's just so sandy. You don't get much cover of of grass in a lot of places. So these areas, just like upland pine savanna, they support a diverse understory. In this case, you get a more um, a more xeric assemblage of um, of understory plants like apuntias and yucca. Um, there's a selaginella species that um, it it's kind of like resurrection fern, where it shrivels up when it dries out, and then when it rains, it kind of unfurls and turns green again. Um, this is also where you get a lot of uh, terrestrial lichens, um, like um, reindeer moss, and lots of other wildflowers, just like upland pine savanna. A few, um, a, a little bit of difference in species composition. Um, on the left is Winkler's firewheel, which is a type of gylardia or blanket flower, and um, it's in. It's a subspecies that's endemic to Southeast Texas. 
um, you, have this, you also get a lot of um, Texas uh, trailing flocks that endangered plant, um, which is also endemic to Southeast Texas. I think just three counties actually. Um, some other plants that are kind of, um, uh, you see more in sand hill and, or in sandy lands habitat. Uh, there's actually a type of um, lupin, uh, which I guess technically is a blue bonnet. Uh, there are only a handful of um, accounts of this species in, in East Texas, so it's, it's really rare. And um, yeah, so uh, one of the one of the places I would really recommend um, visiting to see this kind of habitat. Let me see. Okay, good. Um, so Big Thicket in the Turkey Creek unit has a Sandhill Loop Trail. Right now, it's not accessible because we have a bridge that's out. But um, I'd like to kind of give a little plug to um, the Roy E. Larson Sandy Land Sanctuary run by the Nature Conservancy, um, which is a really, a really great place to see um, sand hill habitat. Uh, they do a really great job over there. So that was, um, that was what I had prepared for you guys. Uh, it wasn't um, comprehensive to all vegetation types in Big Thicket, of course, but um, I hope that kind of gave you a little bit of a, a sense of what we've got going on here. Um, and uh, yeah, hope maybe and inspire a trip over to, to see us one of these days. All righty, are you ready for some questions? I am, yes. All right, I think the first one we have is Pam, and actually, Pam, you've got two. Well, they were they were sort of simplistic questions. I I have not had the pleasure of being of going over and visiting the Big Thicket at all. So, are are a lot of these places accessible by road? Or are we talking about hiking trails into most of the places that you're talking about? Um, yeah, most of them are either on trails or you can park and walk in and it's really close to the road. Okay. So I tried to, I tried to indicate where the, the most accessible ones are because there's a lot of really cool stuff way off trail and stuff, but uh, it's not easy to get to, so. Terrific. Well, you, you certainly make it seem inviting. And then my other question was to show my ignorance what Zarek is. When you're talking about the sandy lens that was on the Zarek end. So it seems to me you're, and Diane told me that means dry. So is that right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. That's right. Yeah. Air, some people call it arid sandy lands. Um, if you ever heard of zero scaping, that's the term for um, growing cactus and stuff in your, in your yard. So yeah, it means dry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, next up is Bruce. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, actually, uh, Andrew, you did a great job. You showed a picture. Um, our scout troop for many years would can canoe down Village Creek and camp on those sandy banks. So you had a picture that was perfect of that. And so I was mm -hmm. first wondering if, um, Village Creek was considered part of Big Thicket. Sounds like it is. It is, uh, not not all of it, but we do have a good corridor around it for most of the way. Um, the Roy E. Larson Sandy Land Sanctuary also um, is is along it, and then there is Village Creek State Park, and there's some private lands too. Great, thank you. All right, next is Tyler. And boy, Tyler has got some good questions. You wanna, you wanna do yours one after another, Tyler? You've got, I think, four now. Uh, sure, the first one, uh, how do the pine flatwoods stay wet with the higher elevation? Um, are they in like sort of a bowl type of feature or is it the soil type or what, what keeps them wet when they're at a higher elevation? I think it's the soil type primarily um, a lot of uh, people say that there's a restrictive layer um, a foot or two under the ground that prevents water from percolating. 
And, um, and so, you know, you combine that with the fact, the fact that it's really flat and we get a lot of rain, um, they just somehow stay wet all the time and they don't drain. Okay. Um, also, does the preserve have any arche uh, archeological projects? I, I was thinking with how big the river would be or used to be that there would be some sort of archeological significance there. Yeah, um, most of the archeological work we do it, are surveys in areas where we need to do work and um, we're just kind of checking to make sure we're not um, negatively impacting any archeological resources. Um, we don't have any, you know, like really good archeological sites that are something really significant. Usually what we find are, um, you know, not settlements per se, it's just kind of like um, charcoal or um, pot sherds, not like an actual, um, not something really significant, I guess. Okay. Um, question three, <laughs> did the river historically have that much salt water in it? Or is that a recent development when you're talking about the salt water coming in? So from what I've read, it's a recent phenomenon that happened when they opened up Sabine Lake to the Gulf. Um, Sabine Lake is what the Natchez River and the Sabine River empty into before entering the Gulf. And so they opened a channel into Sabine Lake and then they channelized or they dredged um, shipping channels up into the port of Beaumont. And so that dropped the elevation of the, the floor and that's what the salt water is able to come into. It's kind of just, they created a highway for the salt water to come in. And um, my final question, does the, I know you were talking about um, some of the invasive species control in regards to plants, but what does the preserve have with invasive animal species? So our main one is definitely going to be feral pigs. Um, and we've tried a bunch of different things over the years. Uh, we've hired contractors to trap them. Uh, at the moment, we have a whole bunch of our own traps and our biological science technician uh, sets those out. Um, we also rely a lot on the public through the hunting program. And then we've also created a hog trapping program to let people get a permit and um, set one of their own traps in the preserve. So we're trying a whole bunch of different methods and um, um, I guess they all, they help, but um, yeah, they're, they're still pretty abundant. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robin and David Novak have a question. Would you like to unmute and ask your question? Go ahead, David. Uh, sure, Andrew, great presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, more on the uh, formation of the uh, Mima Mounds, the, the, uh, temp the Pimple Mounds. I know that's kind of, there are actually a lot of theories, aren't there? Yeah, I've read a few. Some are kind of out there. And <laughs> um, there is a presentation someone did. Uh, I can't remember who it was or which organization, but um, it, they, he made it sound like the leading hypothesis now is that it was, they were wind deposited, I want to okay. say like, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the vegetation anchors the, the sand, but it looks like they're found on alluvium. On your map, I wasn't trying, couldn't see very well, but were they, uh, they looked very rounded. Um, I know that a, a lot of them occur over like point bar deposits, um, but point bars are going to be elongate and uh, not so round. Those look very round on your, on your, uh, your map there. Just, just curious what, what you thought about them. Yeah, they do tend to be pretty circular here, uh, but I've seen them to where they're actually lined up in a line. Okay. Um, so, you know, almost connecting to each other. Um, but yeah, you know, we've dug into them um, putting in wells, um, you know, those uh, hydrologic monitoring wells. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to tell, you know, if there's a major difference in soil type, but um, I'm, I'm not a soil expert, so. <laughs> Can I sneak in with a question? This is Robin. What's the best time of year to go? <laughs> well, right now it's pretty mm -hmm. awesome. 
Um, the trees have just leaped out, um, but you still have a lot of those um, spring ephemerals that are still out, the trilliums and stuff. Um, I would say between now and you know late May, um, and it kind of depends on where you are. So like hardwood forest is really great right now. Um, in maybe another month, the pine savanna, you'll see a lot more uh, wildflowers in the pine savanna. And then, um, I mean, winter is also a great time if you wanna be on the water or if you wanna kind of be able to see the vistas at uh, the Canyonlands unit. So really just depends on you know what you wanna see. Okay, um, uh, Patty Trimmingham has a question. Would you like to unmute Patty? Yeah, hi, Andrew. I just wanted to know what, was there any impact with Hurricane Harvey on the preserve? Um, there was, um, in terms of impacts to the natural communities, um, it, it wasn't bad at all. Uh, you wouldn't even know today um, really, it had more of an impact on some of the park infrastructure, like the boardwalks and um, two of our big um, pedestrian bridges were taken out or almost taken out. And so, um, yeah, and actually to this day, we're still working on replacing those or fixing them. So, um, so yeah, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the plant communities, the animal, animal communities, uh, they are really resilient to it. It was, it's pretty kind of crazy because you wouldn't know what happened um, five years ago. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, are there any more questions? There are no more in the chat. Um, does anybody else have another question before we wrap this up? I really enjoyed this. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>